Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural Amazon Aid podcast. I'm Charlie Espinosa, and today I'll be interviewing the world-famous biologist, Dr. Tom Lovejoy. Tom's a professor in the Environmental Science and Policy Department at George Mason University. He is fondly known as the godfather of biodiversity, and for good reason. He helped coin the term biological diversity and also has had a tremendous influence in bringing conservation into public policy. He served as an advisor to the Bush and Clinton administration, as well as to the United Nations and World Bank. And Tom is one of the founders of the much beloved PBS series, Nature. But perhaps most importantly, Tom's also one of the leading experts on the Amazon. So today I talked to Tom about his experience in the Amazon, why he loves it, and why he thinks it's such an important place. We also talk about why many experts think that the Amazon is on the tipping point and what can be done to reverse this process. And finally, we also talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the environmental lessons that we can learn from it. So without further ado, I bring you Tom Lovejoy. So Tom Lovejoy, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome to what I'm going to call the inaugural Amazon Aid podcast. Cool. So Tom, you first came to the Amazon about 50 years ago now. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you there initially and also what your earliest impressions of the Amazon were? So it's actually, it'll be 55 years in June. And as I mentioned before, I, I was just interested in having science adventures. And I actually had planned to do a PhD on montane forest birds in East Africa, because I was gaga about East Africa. Uh, and then I got an opportunity to go for a few weeks to the Amazon, to Bra the port city, Belang in Brazil, uh, and work out in the forest. And I just, I never looked back, right? I was, as I'd like to say, it was 97% intact, an area as big as the 48 states, just overflowing with biological diversity. Uh, and it was, you know, it was like a, a Christmas, a biologist Christmas stocking with no end to it at all. <laughs> uh, I never looked back. Yeah. So you mentioned biodiversity. I was really shocked to read that you actually helped coin the term biological diversity, which now is so familiar to us that it seems like it's been around forever. So why don't you give us a scientific definition of what biological diversity is? So biological diversity is a sort of a collective word that describes the variety of life on Earth. You can think of it as all the species of plants and animals and microorganisms, but it's also the different kinds of biological formations, whether a prairie or a rainforest. Uh, and it's also the diversity at the genetic level in individual organisms. Great. And can you tell us why biodiversity matters, not just to conservationists or ecologists, but to everyone? First, let me just say, I think there's something inherently wrong in terminating a 4 billion year line of evolution, which is what every species on Earth represents, right? Um, and so I tell my students that, and they decide whatever they want to decide. But uh, so basically, biological diversity runs this planet. Uh, it, it cycles elements, it cycles water, uh, it's responsible for the amount of oxygen we have in the atmosphere uh, that wasn't there at the beginning of life on Earth, that was created by life on Earth. Right. So let's start talking again about the Amazon, which is, of course, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So I want to talk about particular species. Do you have an, a favorite Amazon animal or plant and uh or fungus potentially <laughs> and do you what's for you the most amazing thing about the amazon as a system well you know it's impossible to answer that question uh, 
because there's so many wonderful and fascinating things. So I, I do have a, a really soft spot for a whole family of birds called mannequins with brightly colored males that do elaborate courtship dances. <laughs> uh, I have serious weakness for the morpho butterfly with its iridescent blue wings, uh, which just blow people's mind the first time they see it. Uh, and I guess if I were to, well, first of all, there's some really amazing plants uh, and trees in those forests. Uh, Brazil nut tree is a pretty amazing tree in itself. Uh, very elaborate dependence on forest floor rodents to actually distribute their seeds. Uh, and maybe the the fungus that the 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 leaf cutting ants use to in their fungus farms, which they grow underground. Huh. Nice, you hit all three: plant, animal, and fungus. Well, you laid them out there. Yeah, I'm glad I did. So, Tom, you and some other colleagues now almost 20 years ago proposed that the Amazon might be on the tipping point. Can you tell us what that means exactly? And if there's any prospect for us to reverse the process, or if we've already reached the point of no return. So what that is all about in the end is the Amazon has an amazing hydrological cycle in which the Amazon literally generates half of its own rainfall internally. Uh, moisture comes off the tropical Atlantic, uh, and falls as rain, but then a huge amount of, of what has fallen evaporates off the complex surfaces and is transpired through the leaves. And so the moisture actually recycles five or six times uh, between the Atlantic and the Andes. Um, and the key to that is tropical rainforest and its complex surfaces and all those leaves transpiring. And after, after a rainstorm, you can actually see plumes of moisture emerging from the top of the, of the forest, uh, you know, and that's the hydrological cycle, you know, about to move further westward and become rain again. Uh, so the question has always been, you know, how much deforestation would cause that cycle to degrade. Uh, and rather than give you a long, tortuous scientific history, um, there's long been concern that whenever that chipping point is reached, that the Southern and Eastern Amazon will be particularly vulnerable uh, because there is less rain there uh, and it doesn't take too much reduction in the rainfall there to no longer to be able to support a rainforest. So anyway, that, that tipping point seemed very, very far distant and needed to be reevaluated re recently uh, because the forests were also being subjected to climate change and to extensive use of fire. So you had a negative synergy going on between the three. Uh, rainfall has been declining in, in the uh, Amazon vulnerable region, if we want to call it that. Uh, tree species composition has been changing towards species that need less rain. Uh, and most important, every five years or so, there have been unprecedented droughts, uh, incredible droughts. Uh, and Carlos Nobre, who's the climate scientist in Brazil, I work with closely on this, both view those droughts as sort of the, the uh, first uh, 
fibrillations of the system uh, as it approaches collapse. Uh, so what will it look like? It's pretty hard to say, but it, it's, it's unlikely to be something as precipitous as, as pushing over the Washington Monument, right? Uh, it'll start slow and then it will gather speed. Uh, and this is important not only for the southern and eastern Amazon and the biodiversity and the people who live there, it's important to agriculturalists in central Brazil who get moisture from the Amazon. And in fact, the moisture from, moisture from the Amazon benefits every country in South America except for Chile. It's really part of a continental climate system. Uh, so the good news is that it's all about trees and it's all about leaves. And so if there is aggressive reforestation and a very deliberate policy to counterbalance any new deforestation with say three or four times as much reforestation, you can build back the system into a much more secure state. Well, I want to keep talking about solutions, but shift the discussion to the developed world and particularly the United States. So as with many environmental problems, the developed world bears a lot of the responsibility for the damage that's been done to the Amazon, whether that's through greenhouse gas emissions or through the purchase of gold, which is deforesting the Amazon at alarming rates. So I wanted to ask you, if there's something that you think people could be doing as responsible citizens in the developed world to help protect the Amazon. So you mentioned gold and that obviously is a really important issue because of all the illegal gold mining that goes on. Uh, terrible, terrible social consequences. Uh, you know, the the people that come out of the Andes and down to the Amazon of Peru to do gold mining are really the victims in that system, mm -hmm. uh, leading terrible lives, very unhealthy lives. Uh, and it's sort of hard to imagine, but of course, if you, if you follow the economic chain, it, it goes ultimately to the developed world where all that gold is, is actually purchased and turned into ornaments, right, for human beings, uh, largely. And uh, so there's, there's, I think, real power in developing a movement that really is selective about the gold that they buy uh, and requires a real certification system that's dependable uh, because you know anytime you are you're buying a i don't know a cuff link or something uh which would seem absurd of course to the people who are mucking through the <laughs> the sediments looking for the gold uh, but if we insist that it has you know a certifiable, sustainable origin, it will, in the end, it will choke off all that illegal trade because there'll be no money to be made. Absolutely. And I should mention that that's something that Amazon Aid is trying to do right now, which is educate people about the impacts of buying gold and ultimately, hopefully hold jewelry companies accountable for the impact that they're having on the Amazon and also other parts of the world. So let's go back to that topic on everyone's mind right now, the coronavirus. So obviously the coronavirus is a really tragic thing from the perspective of human health, and there's a lot of negatives to this. But one of the few positives is that the world has slowed down a bit, which has had some environmental benefits. Do you have any thoughts about that or if there's uh, some kind of a silver lining to Corona and this experience from a conservation perspective? 
people are seeing stars in New York City that they haven't seen forever, if at all. Um, but I think the more important thing is that, in fact, we did this to ourselves. It's our incursion on nature uh, that has brought us, you know, face to face with the potential for infection. Uh, and it's and it's not the first time, right? It's like like every year there are a couple new viruses discovered and uh, they come from animal hosts in nature. And sometimes, you know, they get really out of hand like this one. Uh, so that plus, you know, the, the wildlife trade and the wildlife markets uh, in Southeast Asia and China uh, are just, we're just open invitations uh, to essentially the coronavirus to jump into humanity and have the impact that it has. Mm -hmm. So the solution is to be much more respectful of the natural world, uh, to recognize that the planet works as a linked biological and physical system, and to treat it respectfully and manage it that way, which is a very arrogant way of saying actually that we have to manage ourselves. Yeah, well, let's hope the experience helps us all begin to manage ourselves better and in turn start respecting the planet more. So we're out of time, but I do want to end on a more optimistic note and ask you, we hear a lot about fires and uh, deforestation in the Amazon, but are there things from a conservation perspective that we can also be really proud of and perhaps heartened by? Well, I mean, to start with, just the ability to understand how the Amazon works as a system and has to be managed that way is, is an incredible accomplishment, uh, which gives us the opportunity to do the right thing about it. Uh, but you know, when you when you read the news about the Amazon, it's ninety nine percent about the bad news, uh, and the good news just doesn't get the attention uh, that all that bad stuff does. So when I when I first set foot in the Amazon, there was only one national park. In Venezuela it was, and one demarcated indigenous reserve was the Shingu Reserve in Brazil. And that was it in the entire Amazon, which I remind you is the size of the 48 continental US states. Today, approximately 50% of the Amazon is either in formal designated conservation areas or informally demarcated indigenous areas. Uh, that is just an almost unimaginable achievement. Uh, you know, in essentially 30, 40 years, an area equivalent to half of the 48 continental states under some form of protection. Now, is it perfect? No. Uh, are there things to worry about? Yeah, we need to worry about protecting the Amazon as a system. Uh, but every single one of those Amazon countries was engaged in serious Amazon conservation. Uh, and there's every reason to think that new generations like President Duque of Colombia, for example, um, will build on that and lead us in the right direction. Great. Seems like a good note to end on. Well, Tom, thanks for, thanks for being with me. I really appreciate it. Glad it worked.